Hey guys, Emily here, and I have a video today for our intervention teachers. I was going through my computer and I found a presentation that I had given at the California Reading Conference and the California League of Schools Conference back in about 2018 is when I presented this. And I thought it was going to be a, a really good idea for you to see where I had come from as far as the programs that I had participated in and um, managed and to actually see some data to see what kind of gains we had. So you'll see the gains at the end, but before we jump into it, I would love it if you would like, subscribe, and please share this video. Um, leave me a comment. All of those things tell the YouTube analytics that this is a video worth watching, and hopefully we can reach out to other intervention teachers who could benefit from anything that I may have to offer. All right, so what I'm going to do is jump in and share my screen. And again, just a little bit of background. What this presentation was from was what we had done from about 2015 to 2017 after I moved over to this, uh, it was Webster Elementary School in Golden Valley Unified in Madera. And um, I took lots of data and we made some amazing gains and I wanted to share that with other schools up and down the state. And so I was able to present at both of those conferences, super fun time. But what I like about this is it gives you kind of a bigger vision, starting with the research and as far as why we're doing what we're doing, um, what kinds of decisions we made based on data, how we trained people, and then the results that we got with our kids. So are you ready? I'm going to go ahead and share and we will see if we can get you right back to it. Okay, so this was my school-wide literacy intervention model presentation that I did. We called this an RTI success story, and it was a fantastic group um, that I was able to work with at Webster in the reading lab, and just ugh, the best time ever. Best school district. If you're out there, shout out to all of my GVUSD peeps. Love you guys. So let me start with our demographic. Um, these are the, you know, we always have to pay close attention to our subgroups and to see how those students are being affected by our um, instruction. And so just to give you an idea, we were really about um, half of the population was Hispanic and half was Caucasian. And then we had little smatterings of other uh, demographics in there. We did have an 8% population on IEPs and about a 45% population on socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, a 14% EL population, and just under a 3% foster youth. Now, all of those numbers were growing um, as our district was growing, but that's what they were at the time in 2017. This particular program um, vision started with two amazing ladies, Wendy Woods and Kathy Gorman, who wanted to take on a school-wide approach to intervention, and they created this from the ground up. It was an amazing program to walk into. Unfortunately, after they had left, there were a few years where it kind of lost some of the vision, um, and so I came in as a form of rescue to... Um, rejuvenate this. And I'm so glad I did because it was an amazing, amazing situation. So the goal of our intervention was to strength, strengthen the foundational literacy skills and strategies for every single one of our underachieving students. And we did this by measuring ongoing, ongoing school-wide assessments. And this is the important part. We did all of this while protecting the core instruction. We never ever pulled students out of tier one instruction. It can be done. I'm gonna show you how to do that. So we need to know what the research says about um, RTI. And when you look at John Hattie's research, the effect size of 1.07 is extremely high that the RTI model and strategy for intervention can be super effective. And so, that is, you know, we always have to need, need to know what the evidence and research is saying. A couple of other things. There is 
a lot of research that supports that tier two intervention, uh, especially for small group instruction, it can be highly effective in helping students master those essential early literacy skills, which is what we focused on. And then again, another outcome of a really strong RTI model is that you will see a decrease in the number of SPED referrals. When, when tier one instruction is strong and tier two instruction is really solid and does a good job of catching those kids up, you will have fewer students in need for special ed. And that is really what a, an amazing byproduct of all of this. So we know that that RTI model, we've got our little pyramid, um, and something unique that I think our school did is that we delivered our RTI based on need, not based on the student's label. So we would have students that may have been on an IEP receiving intervention um, services in that RTI model. They may have, and then also be receiving their IEP services at a different time. We would have some students that had not been identified yet, and we could give them up here into a, basically our tier three so that we could try to prevent some SD, or, or I'm sorry, some special ed referrals when needed. So it all starts with the data, and you've heard me say it, I'm a bit of a data-driven diva, and so we did a lot of data-driven decision-making, and it started with our paraprofessionals, and every single year we would pull our paras from our district, I would train them in how to assess. Now, at the time of this presentation, we were transitioning from Dibbles to Acadians. So the data is going to be on um, with Dibbles at this time. Acadians was then what we brought in um, next, but I actually, you have to train your assessors to know how to assess students. If you're gonna get good data, it's got to be clean. So that's exactly what we did. Every year we took um, a full day and we trained everybody in how to assess our students using those measures. And so we used Dibbles at the time, again, transitioned into a cadence uh, shortly after that, that um, all of our students grades two through six received the Dibbles oral reading fluency. They did the retail fluency. Our K1s did a letter, a letter naming fluency, phonemic segmentation, and a nonsense word fluency. And we did this three times a year. We also had additional data. We used the um, star reading as a, an additional component. It was not something that um, we did in the reading lab. We just collected this da data so that we had another point uh, uh, what do you call it, data point. And we also used district benchmarks that we were using School City at the time. And all of that was basically the way that we could validate who was in need of intervention. So we based our services on our universal screening data on, at the time it was SBAC, it's now um, CASP. So the, the measures have changed a little bit, but we looked for our students that were below basic or far below basic. And yeah, or whatever they call it now. And we looked at class benchmarks, CELT data at the time, again, now it's LPAC and teacher recommendation. So these were the measures that we looked at. It started though here with our universal screening. These others were kind of, um, again, used to validate um, what we were seeing. And so we took this data and I love the color coding of the systems that we could get. Um, Dibbles, this was their report at the time. Acadians has uh, one that's even better in my opinion, but we color code our students and the data comes in that way. I was manually inputting the data and we could see who, was, who were our students that were well below benchmark, who was, below benchmark and then at or above. And we started with these group, these kids here, we used the four quadrant um, data analysis that um, you may be familiar with. I won't get into that here, but that's how we started to place our students. 
Um, and we selected our reading lab students first. So we assessed the entire school, 580 kids at the time, that got up to almost 650. Um, and we took about three weeks to do it, pulled our reading lab kids first. Those were the kids we knew we needed to have spots for in the reading lab. But then what we did, um, this is our, we're going through our data. These are, these are my little reading divas. Um, we are actually analyzing that data and figuring out who is coming into the lab first. And then what we did with the remaining kids is I provided a staff development day where we are training the teachers in how to analyze the data. And so the teachers are now taking who was left out of their classes, um, the students that were not going to the reading lab, and they are looking at the data because what we do is created platooning groups. So the remaining teachers, you could see if we had three teachers here or four teachers here, the remaining kids were going to be placed into one of their platooning groups. And so they were given a spreadsheet just like this, and they were given um, basically based on the skill deficits that they noticed, what was the skill focus of those platooning groups, who was going to go there and who, where was their homeroom placement. And we always had also a challenge group or an enrichment group in addition to our kids that needed still some support but just did not go into the reading lab. So that was about 75% of our student population went into those groups. And we ran basically a platooning time where each grade level was given a 30 minute window. And this was also the time that the reading lab would meet. And so the beauty of this is that every single student was going to a homogeneously grouped um, a group of students that were based on assessed need. So when our third graders at 10 o'clock were coming into the reading lab, the remaining third graders were placed between three different teachers. So the beauty, every single kid was moving at the same time. This is how you keep kids from missing core instruction. Nobody missed core instruction because for 30 minutes every day, we paused core instruction so that every kid could get what they needed at their level. It was brilliant. For those schools that don't have a platooning in place, it might be a little bit of a hard sell, but honestly, it is the secret sauce. It really is. So in the platooning groups, we know that 75% of those students were placed there, and those groups are directed by the grade level teachers. The curriculum and the instruction is matched to assess need, and we still focus on those early literacy skills. So the groups we're focusing, we might have a group focused on fluency or comprehension or writing or decoding vocabulary. Our challenge group, that's what we called our high performers, they were in a group where they could do do more of enrichment types of um, instruction. These groups met every single day for 30 minutes. The class sizes are smaller because what we've done is we've taken the kids that were the most needy, we put them in the reading lab, and let's say that that, that below basic group of kids um, maybe there weren't spots for them in the reading lab. So if they were still in need, we kept those platooning groups small. Our largest groups were our enrichment groups um, where they were doing more, you know, kind of hands-on types of things to grow and expand their learning. And our kids that needed instruction were small. So you can see here is a sixth grade platooning group. And we've got about two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, maybe about 14 or 15 kids in this group as opposed to 36, okay? So they're still getting instruction. Now, all of the instruction that is delivered inside of these platooning groups have to be uh, outside of the core. In other words, teachers were not delivering instruction related to the core. This is the purpose to build literacy skills. So we were using up other supplemental materials. Um, so our 
six, let's see, some of the curriculum or that we would use was Scope Magazine. We used, this was a great tool for comprehension. Word Generation, which is a free resource from SERP. I've done other videos on this. Great vocabulary tool, writing tool for grades four through six. Rewards, we had um, our fourth grade platooning group was delivering rewards to get our fourth graders reading multisyllabic words. Some of our groups were doing novel studies at the upper grades. We had phonics for reading, which is an Anita Archer group, and we did this in our primary. Some primary groups were using guided reading, and they did use leveled reader readers at the time. Words their way um, for spelling uh, and decoding, and step up to writing. These were some of the tools that we used. So what did we do with kids that were basically ahead of the game? They were part of the challenge groups, and so they uh, participated in other creative experiences, like one of our groups wrote the school newspaper. Uh, other groups were writing plays and performing readers theater. Uh, this is a group that is performing a puppet show. They're actually getting visited from an, by another classroom because their, their platooning group wrote their own scripts, created their puppets, and then are performing. And those usually had something to do with our character counts lessons. Um, they would debate hot topics. They would write books. We just had some really creative things for those kids to do. So while all of those 75% of the students in the whole school are in some platooning group, about 25% of the students, 20% um, are in the reading lab, 5% might be in more of a tier three, which may be in the reading lab or may be delivered from a um, SPED teacher. But again, everything was based on need, not on label. So here is the structure of our reading lab and just for some logistics. We served 131 students every day and that was typical. We would run about 120 to 130 students every single day for 30 minutes. I had four well-trained paraprofessionals and myself as the reading specialist who delivered instruction and that instruction was based on skill and based on ass assessed need. Now the groups again, every single day, 30 minutes. And this is at the same time the other kids are in the platooning groups. The students were progress monitored every two to three weeks in the reading lab. We have to check and see frequently if what we're doing is actually moving the needle for those kids. Otherwise, we need to make some um, adjustments. So if growth stagnates, again, adjustments are made to the either the instruction or maybe a new curriculum, a group size. Maybe we, we change the kind of the structure of our direct instruction lesson. Our lab was Title I funded, and so it targeted predominantly our, our low socioeconomically disadvantaged students, some of our RSP students, and our English learners. Those were the students that um, utilized the lab most, but that's not to say that if kids weren't in any of these programs that they were turned away. They were not. It was based on need. And again, students never, ever missed core instruction during this time because everybody was platooning. And so our structure, our, our reading lab structure, 30 minutes every day. And you can see here we did... Um, what we did is the first semester we were meeting with our sixth graders and then the second semester we would meet with our kinder kids. And so that's what that was. Eventually what we ended up doing is not servicing our sixth graders so we could see our kinders earlier and for longer times during the year. That worked really well for us. We didn't have a great need in sixth grade because our kids have participated in intervention for so long and we wanted to get an early jump on them. I did have some time for additional instruction. If I had kids that were maybe my newcomers um, or I had one time I had a student out of district who came in as a sixth grader and just could not read never identified. And so we were doing some special stuff with him. We did some push-ins in our primaries with our paras um, early to give them some extra support. And this is how we um, 
grouped our reading lab time. And so these were all 3.5 hour paras and we adjusted their schedules to fit so that our core teachers, our, our grade level teachers had that morning. They asked, could we have our morning? It's when they're, that's when they're primed. And so that's why we pushed in here and did not actually open the reading lab until 9.30. And I thought, honestly, that was brilliant. And that came from our teachers. So the skills that we targeted always lean towards those five basic literacy skills, phonological and phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, and fluency. And we did a lot of things with our students. We were very multi-sensory. Um, we did small groups. You can see, I think this was probably at the time, a group of first or second graders. We really tried to not have more than five students in a group. Um, we did things, uh, this is a group that was struggling with B and D reversals. And so we were making things very multi-sensory. This is part of our uh, repeated reading time. We use six minute solution. And so the students are partnered up and reading with each other um, and we gave them options. So we had a little bit of flexible seating. And then this is a uh, part of our readers theater group at the end of the semester, which was awesome. So we used a lot of research-based curriculum. This is just to name a few, um, but Scholastic News was a great tool for fluency and comprehension. And honestly, we had this at all levels. I had it for first grade all the way up to fifth grade. We used rewards um, for decoding multisyllabic words, six minute solution from about second grade through sixth grade for fluency, words their way we used for spelling and decoding. Um, phonics lesson library by 95% group came in kind of um, a little bit later. Great, great tools. Phonics for reading with Anita Archer and read naturally for fluency and comprehension. We continued with Take Aim, which is a really great tool with um, Read Naturally is the publisher of that. Great for vocabulary and comprehension. Vocabulary through morphemes when we were starting to really get into some orthography and vocabulary. Academic vocabulary for English learners was another tool we use. An oldie but goodie called Explode the Code for our early literacy, phonics and decoding. Phonemic Awareness by Hegarty was a tool that I still really like. And we did have some various app software and games for skill support. And we used this only on days where we were progress monitoring students. We, the uh, whoever's group it was, whether it was myself or a para, we were progress monitoring every two to three weeks. So every two to three weeks, our students would have a computer day and we were on um, different skill support programs there. So just to show you some of those tools that we used, some of my favorites, but I'm going to tell you the, the be all end all of how this all works is the way the instruction is delivered. You don't have a lot of time in intervention. And we all know that when you get 30 minutes, it probably gets whittled down to 25 by the time you get them all in there. And so we were super, super dialed in on explicit, direct and intense inner uh, instruction. I trained all of my paras in what this looks like and how to deliver it. There was no downtime. There was no time for fluff. There was no time for, you know, chatting. We were in and out in 30 minutes and it was intense, but there's more. So we also made a really big deal to make develop relationships with our students and we had fun. And so we know that when kids are engaged and active, they will learn more. We have lowered the affective filter. This is actually a reader's theater performance with one of our paras and the kids, they get into it and it was just an amazing day. Um, we would take our littles out. We always did something called Brain Game Friday. And so we would do things that were interactive and try to get them moving around if the weather was nice. And so you could see we were doing sight word hopscotch here where the kids had to, they were given a word and had to run and hop on it and say the word. We were looking for multi-sensory approaches. Again, our cute little piggies that did their uh, three little pigs for readers theater. And it just an amazing thing. But 
None of that matters unless you get results, right? Okay, so this is the exciting part. I hope you stuck around. If you're multitasking, come back and take a look at this. So these are all of our reading lab students and I measured the average correct words per minute. This was Dibbles at the time. So you can see this is pre, um, this is August. So this is our, our fall or yeah, our first window of assessment up to May by grade level. And you can see the growth in oral reading fluency from August to May in every single grade level. Now you could see here sixth grade grew just a teeny bit, which was another reason we didn't have a lot of gaps in sixth grade. So this is again, a data dis dis driven decision not to service um, sixth grade, but why we started to bring in kinder. But look at every single group grew an amazing amount. Um, Golly, I, I don't have the number specifically, but you can pause and check that out. But this one is cool, okay? Because I looked at just our SPED kids. These are just our students on IEPs, just our kids on IEPs with their growth. Look at second grade, SPED, IEP kids, kid, not IEP kids, kids on IEPs. Every single group grew amazing results. And then what's really cool, we want to know, do these things transfer to those bigger, higher stakes testing um, situations? So this was the SBAC result from 2016 to 2017 compared to Madera County. And you can go into the CDC website in California and find this. So Madera County is the green. Okay. That's Madera County from what uh, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, percentage at proficiency, okay? Met or, sorry, met or exceeded standards. In Madera County, only 33%. Here's Webster. So the blue and the red is Webster. From 2015 or 15, 16 to the next year, from 44 to 50%, from 37 to 51%, from 45, to 53%. We did have a dip in fifth grade and just FYI, um, all of the county, actually all across the state had a dip, not quite sure what happened there. Um, sixth grade went up. So this was the year, uh, it was 2015, 16 was the year I was hired. So this was after one year that we did some changes to the program. Amazing, amazing results. Okay, so why was our model successful? What was it? And these are some things, these are takeaways that, that, that we've kind of picked apart and, and evaluated. Our district made a commitment to the services. They never gave up on intervention. Our intervention was never eliminated during difficult times. It was always there. We did have to make some cuts, but the district itself had a commitment to this. The community was 100% behind it. And um, so they put in money. They gave money and the administration and the school board support. I would go and share with our school board the kind of growth we were making, what our data looked like, and they were always incredibly supportive. Our RTI was completely supported by our teachers. Our teachers were fully invested in what we were doing because these were not just intervention kids. These were our students. We showed and shared data. So they were just as excited about seeing those data as each of the benchmark, even though my team was collecting the data. Um, they were still doing their own data so that they could hear all of their kids read. Um, it was just a part of our school culture, and it had been because of those amazing ladies almost 20 years ago. Now, another thing that makes it successful is that being a part of this reading lab was never viewed as a negative by any of our students or any of our parents. Our kids loved coming to the reading lab. Other kids that didn't get to come were always like, why are you going there? You guys have so much fun. And we did. We made it a place where they learned and loved it at the same time. We had parents asking to make sure their students could get in. 
of course they had to qualify first, but parents were never, you know, they never had this weird feeling about it. It was wonderful. Our support staff, our paras and our teachers work together to make decisions. Okay. We never, I never made these decisions without my team. We looked at data as a team. We all had a different perspective and that is how the decisions were made. Students were able to move in and out of the reading lab multiple times a year. I never said that kids graduated from intervention. That's not the, the, um, the point I wanted them to think because kids, the cognitive load and the complexity of the text changes as they get older. And when they exit in second grade, they may have to come back in fourth grade. So they know reading lab is here when they need us. And that's what we would do. When they hit their marks, we would move them out. If they ever dip back down and we had room, they came back in. But we knew there is no one single curriculum that can remedy all of the reading problems. We did not invest in kits uh, LLI kits, none of that. We had a number of wonderful quality supplemental programs that could be used for various needs. And that to me was a really um, unique thing that our school did. So we were always looking to the future for um, school improvement. We always looked at our data. We evaluated how we were doing and we celebrated. And with that, it was an amazing, amazing situation. So if you have any questions about what we did, again, I know the data is a few years old, but the premise stays the same. Um, it was, what a great place to work. I, I can't even tell you, it was the greatest place to work. I moved on to another district to try to get something similar and then COVID hit and then I moved to Idaho and here I but I know you can do it. Um, you have to look to the bigger picture. You cannot be a lone soldier. It takes a team and it takes administrative support. So I would love to hear what you're doing in your schools. Um, please leave a comment if you want to know anything deeper about what we did. I hope this gave you an idea and a vision of what can be done and how it can be done. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for being here. Like, subscribe, share, all that. Mwah! Thank you for what you do. Bye for now.